Good afternoon everyone, my name is Brian and I will be leading the hike this afternoon. We're going to focus on the action in and around the Sunken Road. Sunken Road is down in this direction. We're not going to spend a lot of time in the Sunken Road. We're going to make a pretty good circle around it and we'll be able to kind of get a better idea and kind of a bird's eye view and we'll talk about the actions as we're kind of moving around. We're certainly going to get there and we'll finish up the program down at the Sunken Road, but more of a look at <clears throat> Not only the fighting there, we're going to cover that, but also kind of the, the reinforcements moving in, also confusion in the Union 2nd Corps, how far stretched out they were. So the terrain is going to help me tell part of the story because the Union 2nd Corps, 15,000 men, they were stretched out close to a mile and a half. And you'll see that it might answer some questions for you as to why did this guy do this, why didn't they do this. And we're going to get to some parts of the battlefield that some of you probably have not visited before. With that being said, we'll be walking through some tall grass like this. We'll be walking through some open fields like you see out here in front of us. And that's going to be dependent upon this tractor. We're not sure. That's a new, uh, wasn't planning for the tractor being down there. We're not sure what he's doing today, but we're going to be farther to the east of where he is. So hopefully he's just planting and not spreading. <laughs> so we'll play it by ear. Uh, we plan to be out about two to two and a half hours. So we'll be back here three to three thirty. We're going to walk about two miles from here. We're going to make our way down over the ridge. We're going to actually go south of the sunken road towards the Piper Farm, make our way up towards the observation tower and drop off the ridge and head out towards the Antietam Creek. And then circle back around and come up behind this white farm behind me here, the Muma Farm and the Roulette Farm, and then make our advance towards the sunken road. So we're going to jump around a little bit, jump around a little bit. But the thing with the sunken road is the, the, the fighting is pretty easy to follow. As we stand here, the federal forces would have moved across our front left to right, attacking the Confederate position in the sunken road. Other times, for example, up here on the northern end of the field, there are troops here and there and kind of moving around. This is pretty straightforward. Federals assaulting the Confederate position in the sunken road. How many folks are visiting the battlefield for the first time this afternoon? First time visitors? One. Two. Okay, great. Welcome. This one, this one. All right. So just to get everyone on the same page, we're standing in pretty much the center of the battlefield. This is a one day fight, September 17, 1862. <clears throat> After 12 hours of fighting, 23,000 soldiers killed, wounded, or missing. And if you get the map at the front desk, or if you read a little bit about Antietam, this goes for everyone here. You might have heard of the three phases of battle, morning, midday, and afternoon. And I think after the, the walk today, you'll see I would say it's a little more too, because the fighting and the action up here in the cornfield in the West Woods kind of leads to the fighting down at the sunken road. Where the fighting down at the Burnside Bridge, it starts at the same time. It starts at 9.30, same time the fighting here at the sunken road unfolds, but a mile and a half away. So really I would say there's one Battle of Antietam, but you could say two different battlefields. And that's debatable. There was some stuff going on in the middle part of the field. Some of you that were out last week with Jess, I know it was, it was pouring. It was very uh, rainy and wet. A few, group, few folks came out and joined them. But another good thing with these hike programs is that we'll be able to kind of relate back. For those that have been following along with us since mid-March, uh, we'll be able to maybe tie some things together here today. But at any rate, <clears throat> look at the battle more as kind of two parts rather than three. And I think that kind of simplifies things. But standing here up to the north of us, the cornfield is a half a mile away. The north woods is a line of trees a mile in the distance. Trees out behind me, that is the east woods, and the trees in that direction, the west woods. First four hours of battle raged on this square mile of land. 10,000 casualties in the first four hours. Arguably the bloodiest square mile of the history of the nation, this piece of land right here. At 9.30 in the morning because of the timing of the U.S. attacks, the distance between the federal forces arriving on the battlefield and this rolling terrain, time, distance, terrain, caused the fight to quiet down up here. And as things up here quieted down, that's when the federal assaults shifted southward towards the sunken road, which we'll be diving into in more depth this afternoon. Final part of the battle, or kind of the second half of the battle, second part of the battle, Two miles down to the south of us, that's where the famous lower bridge or the Burnside Bridge crosses the Antietam Creek. Federal troops commanded by Ambrose Burnside start making their way towards the bridge at about 9.30. Around noon to one, they've carried the bridge. 
It took about two and a half to three hours to get 10,000 federal soldiers across the narrow span and to get them reformed and resupplied. And then right around 3.34 in the afternoon, the final federal assault started on the south end of the field. And just as Union soldiers got to the very end of the Confederate line, it was at that point, the last group of Confederates arrived on the field from Harper's Ferry. And they appeared on the end of and even behind the U.S. line and the federal forces fell back down towards Antietam Creek. At that point, the fighting on the field slowly faded away. 12 hours of fighting, the Union Army gained, you could maybe say a half a mile, with 23,000 soldiers killed, wounded, missing. The following day, Robert E. Lee, unable to renew the battle, nor is George McClellan. Both armies gonna sit and stare at each other, care of the wounded, bear of the dead. Some informal truces take place. There's still some little bit of fighting on the south end of the field. On the evening of the 18th though, Lee gathers up the forces that he could. He was forced to leave his wounded and dead upon the field. He lost a quarter of his army in 12 hours of fighting gathers those that he could, moves west four miles, crossed the Potomac River, retreated back into, at the time, the state of Virginia. Today, four miles in that direction, you cross Potomac River into Shepherdstown, West Virginia. West Virginia was not a state when this battle was fought, not until about eight months later. So as Lee retreats, battle certainly a northern victory for many reasons. Number one outcome of the battle, Abraham Lincoln able to announce the Emancipation Proclamation. First in many steps leading to the 13th, the 14th, 15th Amendment, the Emancipation also allows black Americans to join and fight in the federal army and over 200,000 did indeed do that. So some would want to argue maybe not a resounding battlefield victory for George McClellan, but the political outcomes battle make the battle a northern victory, make it one of the, the key turning points in the American Civil War. All right, that is a very quick overview, couple of the landmarks. At any point, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to stop and answer questions for you, not a problem at all getting into our part of the story now. We're looking at starting the story right about 7.30 in the morning. The Union Second Corps, 15,000 soldiers. When the day begins, they're a mile and a half away on the other side of the Antietam Creek. The creek is a mile behind me. And at about 7.30 in the morning, those 15,000 soldiers commanded by Edwin Sumner are ordered to start making their way towards the field. Cross the Antietam Creek by way of a ford and in doing so, those 15,000 men became stretched out. And they broke down into three groups or three divisions, 5,000 in each division. At about 9.15 in the morning, the commander of the Second Corps, once again, Edwin Sumner, he has already moved out of the East Woods. You can see this light-colored vehicle down here. Sumner is in that general area of the field, and he looks across the field, does not see a Confederate soldier. What he can see, though, is the, the battlefield with tens of thousands of casualties. No fighting forces, I should say. No strong Confederate forces on this northern part of the field, on this side of the Hagerstown Turnpike, or north of the Sunken Road. You can see the stone tower in the distance, general location of the Sunken Road for those that have not been here before. We'll see it much better in just a minute or two. <clears throat> But what Sumner is able to see from out there, his, his plan is that he's gonna continue pressing west and then he wants to wheel and move southward to try and roll up this end of the Confederate line. And so in addition to moving the first group of 5,000 directly east woods to west woods, and that's what we focused on a couple weeks ago, the fighting in the west woods, <clears throat> the next group of 5,000 5,000 commanded by William French. That's who we're going to focus on today. And the second group of 5,000 moving to the south, Israel Richardson. What happens is as Sumner is out there, he pushes the one division of 5,000 that direction, and the next two divisions are sent southward. He can see a thin line of Confederate infantry, and Sumner can see a couple battle flags along the horizon. And so he sends French's men in that direction to guard the flank of this large assault going into the West Woods. In addition to the guys from the Second Corps moving in these two different directions, right down behind me by this point would have been about 1,200 Union soldiers, part of the Union 12th Corps, commanded by George Green. Green is on the other side of the ridge. He had fought up in that northern and eastern part of the cornfield, and as his men advanced south, drove off Confederate artillery that was on this high ground for about the first two hours of battle and Green's men are down in this low area being resupplied, being resupplied. And they'll become part of the big story too, kind of not phases, but looking at how 
actions over here influence what's going on down at the sunken road and stuff at the sunken road influences what's going on up here okay so we're going to leave <clears throat> over 5,000 Union soldiers eastwoods to westwoods and eventually just to finish that story and wrap them up they are hitting the flank right behind the Dunker Church here hitting the end of the line almost simultaneously Confederate reinforcements coming up three long Union battle lines going to the westwoods the fighting so confusing, soldiers from New York are leveling their muskets and firing right to the backs of their own men from Massachusetts. 2,200 out of 5,300 killed or wounded in about 20 minutes. And those federal forces, all 5,000 of them, are driven out in that direction. While that's going on, you still have George Green's men down here. And it's the terrain, this ridge that we're on, and you'll see shields the men down there from what's going on up here. And so Green's men are down there, and then moving in on the left of Green will be the second large group of 5,000 men from the Second Corps, William French's men. And then an hour later, the third group of 5,000 arrive in the field, Israel Richardson. But we'll get into that story a little bit later on as we move. We're going to now go, let's see, we're going to move just to the left of this group here, a couple of artillery pieces, and we're going to make our first stop over there. Any quick questions before we, we head out? I know it's a very quick overview. I said we'll try and piece this all together as we move along but just to get us moving we have a good good bit of ground to cover in a, a short bit of time so anything before we head out okay we'll head out in this direction here we heard again the artillery firing down there so you know that's a 12 pound napoleon it is firing a half of charge of what the civil war artillery men would have fought that's a pound of black powder required two and a quarter pounds of black powder to fire one 12, non, one 12 pound Napoleon one time. Over 500 cannon here involved in the battle. They fired roughly 50 to 60,000 artillery rounds over the course of 12 hours. Add to that three to four million bullets fired over that same time span. The high ground that we just moved off of, key Confederate artillery position when the day unfolded, 20 guns up there pointed north and northeast. As I mentioned, George Green's appearance and advance out of the East Woods and Cornfield, as well as the long range Union artillery on the other side of the Antietam Creek is what forced those 20 guns to fall back right around 8, 8.30 in the morning. And then Federal artillery will move up. The first group of guns will take position where the Maryland Monument was located, just across the street from the Dunker Church. So just a little north of where we started. These guns here represent John Tompkins Rhode Island Artillery. They were the second Union battery to move into this area. Six guns and the line stretched up in that direction. And they are down here while George Green's men are down in this area as well. They're in this position before the federal assaults on the sunken road unfolded. And when the fighting down there starts, the Union battle line stretched from the other side of this lane. This lane was here. This is the Moomaw farm lane. It was here on the day of the battle. So the Union line stretched from the other side of the fence here out towards the tower. And as the attacks are back there starting to unfold, just so happens as part of this Confederate counterattack driving Sedgwick's men out of the West Woods, some Confederate troops from South Carolina will advance towards the artillery, Tompkins men advance over the ridge and down into the flank of the artillery. Some of the guns are able to be turned, but nonetheless, the artillerists and some of the infantrymen from the 28th Pennsylvania, 102nd New York, get into some hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Confederates over, over these guns. The artillerist, one of them is using a rammer and he uses that as a bat to strike down a Confederate. The Federals are able to hold the guns one of the commanders here, Ben Child, one of the battery commanders, he is <clears throat> awarded the Medal of Honor. He's wounded, falls back, and then comes back up to take command of his cannon again. There were 20 Medal of Honors awarded for actions at Antietam. We'll hear about four of them this afternoon. So Ben Child is the first. <clears throat> They're able to recapture the cannon, as I mentioned. They're involved in counter battery fire out to the front right of us, as well as towards the Piper Farm to the south of us. 
Also at one point after the first Union attack towards the sunken road kind of stalls out, Confederate General James Longstreet, who's in charge, kind of this part of the field from the Dunker Church South, you could say Longstreet's running the show. From the church north, Stonewall Jackson is in charge. Longstreet will order a charge of Confederate forces out of the sunken road forward, and they're quickly driven back by from this artillery as well as as well as the next wave of infantry moving forward. Long story short, Tompkins, his men fire over a thousand rounds in three hours. High rate of fire, so much so that they they break their cannon. The vent hole at the back of the cannon barrel just kind of melts away and they have to replace their cannon after the Battle of Antietam. All the cannon tubes on the battlefield are original. They are from the Civil War. The wheels, the carriages, all that trail reproduction. The tubes are original, not necessarily from Antietam, and they're in actual positions held by either the North or the South throughout the day of the battle. Okay. All right, next stop, we're going to go down here through the holes in the fence, and then we're going to cut through this tree line here. Uh, just be careful as we make our way through there. You might find some groundhog holes. Those are going to be everywhere, but especially in this tree line, we might find some. And we're going to get out here into the open field. I'll mention that at the time of the battle, the Muma family, they had a cornfield planted here in front of us. Um, if you look through the hole in the fence here, you could see where the tan kind of changes to green a couple hundred yards away. That was kind of the, the width of the cornfield, if you will. It stretched right up to this tree line. This tree line was a fence line, worm fence, and that was the northern edge of the Muma cornfield. And so cornfield to the left of this tree line, open area here to the right, to the right, okay? So we're gonna move out here into this open field pretty unusual to get out into that part of the field unless you visit here in off times because we lease the land out to local farmers 75 percent of the battlefield is leased out and so being that we're out here in the early part of the string not much is going on yet in the fields so we're going to get a pretty good opportunity to be out there it's going to give us a good look at what the federal forces on this part of the attack towards the sunken road we're facing men from the first delaware we're here we will hear about as well as the 14th connecticut but we're going to move down over here Okay, just looking behind, you can see how far we have moved off of the high ground. And as you're down here, you can barely see the east woods to the north of us, and you definitely can't see Maryland Monument, you can't see the Dunker Church, you can't see the west woods. So everything that's going on over there, how can 5,000 soldiers be driven out and no one knows about it down over here? Well, you can see right now cannot see that part of the field. And we didn't have to come down here to not be able to see anything. Just when we buy the artillery pieces, just moving 15 yards off that high ground, you lose sight of that whole northern area of the battlefield. So as we're standing here, the sunken road is this fence line out in front of us a couple hundred yards away. Sunken road, not a trench dug out by the soldiers. It was here before the battle. It was a shortcut local farmers used to go between the Hagerstown Turnpike, which is Route 65 today, running north and south, connecting in with the Boonesboro Turnpike, and that's the road that runs east and west through the town of Sharpsburg. Runs a long way. The fighting occurred in just a very small stretch. From the Moomaw Farm Lane right here, just past this ridge, the Moomaw Lane dead ends into the sunken road. From that point up to the tower, these fields where the fighting unfolded. We are now on the far right of the federal line as they were moving southward. And again, the regiments that moved right through here the 1st Delaware, 14th Connecticut, they're in the 1st and 2nd wave moving forward. Now, again, back to the 2nd Corps, 15,000 men broke down into three divisions. The 1st Division in that direction, the other two attacked the sunken road. So we could take the 1st Division and break it down into three groups, three brigades. One brigade followed up 200 yards by a 2nd Brigade, followed 200 yards by a 3rd Brigade. And that first division of 5,000 French's men, their battle line stretched from the Mouma Lane to about three quarters of a way to the tower. Not all the way to the tower, but certainly on the other side of the Roulette Farm Lane and about halfway up the hill. Okay. In that first group of 5,000, about 70% of those men, green soldiers, never in combat before. 
second soldier to be awarded the Medal of Honor here in the fighting at the Sunken Road was Charles Tanner. And we'll let his words tell the story of the first Delaware here at Antietam. It said, our colonel dashed in front with the ringing order to charge, and charge we did into that leaden hail. Within less than five minutes, 286 out of 635, and eight of the 10 company commanders lay wounded or dead on that bloody slope. Colonel's horse had been struck by four bullets. Lieutenant Colonel was wounded and his horse was killed. And our dearly loved colors were lying within 20 yards of the frowning line of muskets of the Confederates, surrounded by the lifeless bodies of nine heroes who died while trying to plant them in that road of death. So the colors had advanced a little further than we are, quite a bit further than we are. He continued by saying, those of who were yet living got back to the edge of the cornfield right back there, opened up such a fire that though the enemy charged five times to gain possession of the flag, they were driven back each time with terrible slaughter. Charge after charge was made. The gallant 5th Maryland forming on our left aided in the defense of our colors. The 5th Maryland, their monument is the dark color monument straight here to the east of us. The taller tan one is the 14th Connecticut, but the 5th Maryland is out there. So again, 1st Delaware, 5th Maryland, and then out in the distance, the 4th New York. When the Maryland boys joined us, Captain Ricketts of Company C of our regiment called for volunteers to save the colors and more than 30 brave fellows responded. It seemed as if they had just gotten started when at least 20 of them, including the gallant leader, were killed and those who would have rushed forward, they were forced back by the withering fire. Maddened and more desperate than ever, I called for the men to make another effort and before we marched 50 yards, only a scattering few remained able to get back to the friendly corn. Tanner said he then went out on his own, and he said while covering that short distance, he races out again for the colors, he said it seemed as if a million bees were singing in the air, the shouts and yells from either side surrounding like menaces and threats. But I had reached the goal, I had caught up the staff which had already been splintered by shot, the colors pierced with many of a hole and stained here and there with the lifeblood of our comrades when a bullet shattered my arm. Luckily my legs were still serviceable, and seizing the precious bunting with my left hand, I made the best 80 yard time on record, receiving two more wounds. The colors were landed safely among the men of our regiment, just as a large body of Confederates poured in on our flank, compelling us to face a different direction. We had the flags, however, and the remainder of the first Delaware held them against all comers. Charles Tanner awarded the Medal of Honor for saving the colors of his regiment. Not the best photo, but that is a color or a photo of the colors of the first Delaware. See, tattered and shot up as he said. Okay. Now we're gonna make our way towards the other side of the sunken road, get a good view of the Piper Farm and the Piper Orchard. We've talked about the Federals up to this point. We're now gonna change the story and talk about the, the Confederate side and the defense of the road, how it was initially set up, why they're there, who's there, and continue on. Any quick questions before we head out? Were the Marylanders with a different division? Then? They were not, no. They're all part of French's division. Okay. They're all part of Weber's brigade. Weber's brigade was first and then Morris's was second and then Kimball's was third. And so up to this point we're still just talking about French's group. Sir? What sort of crop was there in the field at that time? This right here was just an open field. Um, I don't know if I have. I'll find out. I think it was just a plowed field. I don't remember if it was plowed or a pasture field. But it was open. It was low, low growth. And where the tree line is back, behind the tree line, all the way back to the Moomaw farm, was corn. Was corn. Okay, move on of the Piper Orchard. You look to the south of us, just below the water tower and to the left a little bit, you can maybe see the roof of the Piper Farmhouse. Depending where you are, you might be able to see the barn back there as well. Henry Piper, the owner of the Piper Farm. <clears throat> Along this line and then heading up to the Sunken Road, we have a good view of the Sunken Road from here. You can almost see the entire Confederate line in the Sunken Road stretching from Muma Lane up to the tower from this point. We have that view today, but in 1862, this would have been a cornfield 
right up to the edge of the sunken road. Right up to the edge of the sunken road. And the cornfield stretched out towards the tower, not quite to the tower, almost all the way to the tower. And even with the farm, well, actually right along where we marked, where we walked along that fence line. So it kind of a narrow, or a, as we sit here, a rectangular cornfield. The town of Sharpsburg in 1860, the census reported about 1,200 people in the town of Sharpsburg. This was the first time a large scale battle was fought in the backyard of a significant sized community. You can imagine the impact of bringing 100,000 soldiers, Union and Confederate combined, into a town of 1,200. Everything just disappears. Every house, every little outbuilding, every barn becomes a field hospital. Three days before the armies clashed here, a smaller engagement was fought out along the mountain ridge. Not this ridge here to our front, but beyond it, especially the highest point out here. That is where Turner's Gap is located, and there are two gaps further to the south. But nonetheless, South Mountain, seven miles away, fought on the 14th of September, a Union victory as Confederates fall back and they cross the Antietam Creek. <clears throat> Mary Ellen Piper remembered the scene. She said, in a short time, I perceived them throwing down our fence. The whole column was entering our fields, and in a few minutes, the fences were all level with the ground, and as far as the eye could see was one living mass of human beings. She remembered the Confederates begging for breakfast on the morning of the 15th and the 16th. She said they would come into the house six, eight, ten at a time for breakfast. They would eat anything they could lay their hands on. I believe we fed up to 200 soldiers in a half a day. General James Longstreet, General D.H. Hill will use the Piper House as their headquarters. Henry Piper was, he was oppressed to the rebellion, she said, and he was anxious to see the rebellion suppressed but realizing the Confederates are moving onto his field, he's gonna be as cordial as he could. So everything doesn't disappear, right? So as they were preparing a lunch, a breakfast, a lunch for Longstreet and Hill, the daughters of Henry Piper offered some wine. Longstreet didn't wanna take any of the wine. Hill took some of the wine. Longstreet, afraid the wine was maybe poisoned. But after he saw Hill partake in the wine and Hill was fine. Longstreet supposedly said, well, I'll make, take some of that wine. <laughs> the Pipers eventually made their way. And what happens is with the Confederate forces setting up here two days before the battle, Lee will send out messengers to all the families in the area saying, it looks like there's going to be a battle here. It's going to be in your best interest to, to move on. And so many folks will head back towards Shepherdstown. Some will head towards Keatysville. Others will head north up the Hagerstown Turnpike towards Hagerstown. Let's see. On the way back after the battle, a couple days later, Jerry Summers, who was a slave of the Piper family, and a photo of Mr. Summers right here. This was taken in 1922. He remembered that the Hagerstown Turnpike was so full of Union forces moving towards Sharpsburg that delayed their residents from passing across the road to the house. <clears throat> Mary Ellen, on her way home, she remembered that trees and fences were knocked down, deep holes plowed in the earth by balls shot and shell. As we came home, my heart almost died within me. However, I did not think of turning back. Arriving home, Mary Ellen said, I could scarcely recognize the place. I found the yard covered with bloody clothing, straw, feathers, and everything that was disgusting. People in Sharpsburg were good at growing potatoes. In 1860, they grew over, well, close to 4,900 bushels of potatoes. Sweet potatoes and Irish potatoes. Henry, or excuse me, Jerry Summers remembered that all of our spuds were dug up and used by the Union forces. I saw them digging many times. 
I helped plow the field after the federal forces had moved away and we only found two bushels remaining in the whole field. Now, General D.H. Hill, he was the one that was entrusted with guarding the South Mountain Gaps out there. And as he fell back off of South Mountain, Hill had about 5,000 soldiers. And he is entrusted with guarding the center of the Confederate line. And so you could take his division and break them down into three groups, three brigades, or I should say five brigades in one division. Three of those groups were sent northward, and the remaining two are the ones that are defending the sunken road when the initial fighting down here begins. All told, in the road, a little over 2,000 Confederate defenders. From just down in front of us, there's a bend in the road. From that bend in the road out to where the car is coming down the Moomaw Farm Lane, you can maybe see the Do Not Enter sign. From that sign to just in front of us, about 800 soldiers from Alabama, commanded by Robert Rhodes. Rhodes remembered of the men making their preparations. He said, a short time after my brigade assumed its new position, and while the men were busy improving their position by piling up rails along their front, <coughs> the enemy deployed in our front in three battle lines, all vastly outnumbering ours, and they advanced steadily. So over here, the Confederates, what they're doing, they're taking the fence in front of them down to eliminate the gaps, and then they're taking the fences from this side of the road, dragging it across, and piling it up to strengthen their position. So that's Rhodes, Alabama soldiers. From the bend in the road, not quite up to the tower. Oh, you could see the parking lot here for the observation tower. On the left side of the parking lot, there's a long area for a bus to park. From about that spot behind me to the bend in the road, four regiments from North Carolina, commanded by George Bergwin Anderson. Anderson remembered his brigade. He said, the fondness of this brigade for prayer meeting and psalm singing united with an ever readiness to fight reminds one of Cromwell's Ironsides. To see these poor devils, many of them almost barefooted and all of them half starved, approach a field where the battle was raging was a pleasant sight. The crash of Napoleons, the roar of the howitzers and the crash of musketry always excited and exhilarated them and as they swung into action they seemed supremely happy. Right at the bend in the road was a position held by the 6th Alabama, commanded by John Brown Gordon. And he was out in front of his line, up on the hill, maybe where that 5th Maryland monument is, in that general area. He was able to look north. He saw the lines of Federals advancing. He said, their gleaming bayonets flashed like silver in the sunlight, and with the precision of step, and the perfect alignment of a holiday parade, magnificent lines moved to the charge, each step keeping time to the tap of the deep-sounding drum. As we stood looking upon that brilliant pageant, I thought, if I did not say to myself, my, what a pity to spoil with bullets such a magnificent parade. Confederates in the road said of the federal soldiers as they advanced, first, they, they kind of appeared out of the ground. They rose up out of the ground. First, the Confederates, they heard them. And they saw the eagles on tops of the giant regimental battle flags. And then the huge flags appeared. And then bayonets and caps, faces and shoulders just slowly rose up out of the ground. When the federal forces were out on the ridge where we stopped, initially and Charles Tanner recovered the flag when they were in that position. When they were out here on this ridge just in front of the sunken road at that point, Confederates given the order to fire. Almost the entire front line of Union soldiers killed or wounded in that initial volley. Again, 70% of those federal troops never in battle before. Now the Confederate forces in the road, you might ask, why were they positioned there? Again, the idea was Hill had five groups, five brigades. Three were sent north. He knew that those three would come tumbling back at some point. And so he's going to use the road from the Muma Lane over to the Hagerstown Turnpike. He's going to use that section kind of as a fallback point to gather up the forces that had been sent north and that were going to come falling back. That was the idea. 
Another thing to keep in mind, the federal soldiers are advancing so close to the road before being fired upon because of the terrain and because of the types of weapons the Confederates in the road were armed with. They were armed with smooth bore weapons, firing at the most about 100 yards, accurately 50 to 75 yards. So the Confederates are really holding their fire because of the terrain in front of them and because of the types of weapons that they have. <clears throat> the artillery position right here is part of the Washington artillery. Their time goes back, they originate in New Orleans. If you go to visit New Orleans, you go to the D-Day Museum, I don't know if it's still there, but just a little block or two away is the Washington Artillery. There's a small museum. Been there? Been there. Remember it? Yep. Just before COVID. Okay, so it's still there. So unless COVID took it out. Still there, <laughs> still there, yep. <clears throat> so again, from Dunker Church, you could say, roughly speaking, Dunker Church South, James Longstreet is in charge from the church north, Stonewall Jackson. And as the fighting is unfolding up here, the artillerists are getting shot down. Longstreet, you can see this is a pretty good area, and quickly the corn starts down, getting knocked down. If you're on a horse, you can kind of see out and look about. William Owen, who was part of the artillery up here, remarked on James Longstreet. He said, Longstreet said on his horseback, sad sidle fashion, occasionally making some practical remark about the situation. He talked earnestly and told us he would have given us a lift if not that, the, that day he had crippled his hand. But Owen went on to say, crippled or not, we noticed he had strength enough left to carry his flask to his mouth, as everyone else did on that terrible hot day. So you have Longstreet up here holding the reins of the staff officer's horses while they're helping to load and fire the artillery. Okay, any quick questions? Any quick questions. We're leaving off kind of with the story. The engagement down here has started. Confederate reinforcements are gonna appear from behind us, moving across the Piper Fields through the orchard. More than likely, the least resistance, path of least resistance is through this draw right here. And you will hear about Ambrose Wright and his attempt to get his troops to the field. In this area, soldiers from Mississippi are gonna move through this cornfield to try and get up to the sunken road. We'll hear about them. Out in front of the sunken road, still federal forces from William French's division. And mentioned one of the soldiers from the 14th Connecticut, one of these green soldiers, joins the army in August of 1862. Jarvis Blinn, right here. He was killed in action. His Heart pierced by a bullet very early on. <clears throat> there we go. Um, soldiers that were killed here at Antietam initially buried on the battlefield. There were 5,800 soldiers buried on the battlefield. The federal soldiers bury their own and then they'll bury the Confederates. And within three to five days, all the soldiers had been buried. Some of them are removed later on to the National Cemetery five years after the battle. Confederates in some instances remain in the fields in 10 years. And then the state of Maryland provided funding to remove the Confederates from the field and take them to three town established cemeteries. Hagerstown, 15 miles up the road. Shepherdstown, out in that direction, six miles away. And Frederick, 25 miles away. Some families were able to well, you could say enlist the help of others to help return their sons home. And that was what happens here in the case of Jarvis Blinn. Back up in Connecticut, uh, this gentleman right here, William Roberts, he was a furniture maker, a cabinet maker, a coffin maker. Supposedly made the best looking coffins in New England. <laughs> He also is using the latest patented technology, airtight coffins. And then the coffins would be packed with pulverized charcoal. And so back in Connecticut, let's see. This appeared in the local paper, this advertisement, okay? And it read, Friends of deceased soldiers, 
Those having friends who have died in hospitals or on the battlefields and are buried at the south wishing to remove their remains north for interment can have it done in a thoroughly reliable manner by one who has had much experience and is well acquainted with the different localities at the south. You can apply to William Roberts, Undertaker, 12th Pratt Street in Hartford, Connecticut. So this gentleman would make his way to the Antietam battlefield. He recovered eight soldiers from Connecticut. One of them, Jarvis Blaine, and took Jarvis back home to his family. They buried him in October of 1862. Most of the family is not as fortunate. Many of their loved ones remain in the fields here or taken to the National Cemetery or other church cemeteries in the area. But with that, we're gonna make our way up towards the observation tower. Just be careful along this fence line here. Might find some groundhog holes in the, in the tall grass. So just be careful as we make our way out there. But, behind us was put up by the War Department, it was completed in 1897. Antietam is one of five battlefields created by the War Department in the 1890s. Fields were used as open air classrooms to bring the military out and look at not so much the minutia, but looking more at the leadership decisions and leadership roles and folded here. All branches of the military still come out to this day. On the average, about 50 to 75 military groups visit the battlefield on a yearly basis. The tower, the tour road, and these black War Department tablets are all products of the War Department ownership years. So you have Antietam, Gettysburg, Shiloh, Chattanooga, Vicksburg. Those are the War Department battlefields. If you go to those places, or if you've been to those places, you'll have seen towers, tablets, and tour roads. 1933, the battlefields were transferred from War Department to the National Park Service. And so from that point, the Park Service has been the caretakers of, of the battlefields. At this point, the sunken road, right towards where the tower is, and then bent sharply to the south. And as you drive the field, as soon as you make this bend right here, you're on the historic roadbed of the sunken road, winding your way down to the Boonesboro Turnpike. This is a good place to also point out, and there are many uh, questions and, and, and thoughts about a large group of federal reinforcements reserves that were not pushed into the battle. This is a good place. Uh, Jess spoke about that last week. We're not going to get into that too much, but this is a good place to show the connection that the 5th Corps made between the Union 2nd Corps, 15,000 soldiers, and the 9th Corps, Ambrose Burnside's men on the south end of the field. We are on essentially the end of the 2nd Corps line, and the line stretched from here all the way out towards and on the other side of Route 65 into the West Woods. So the line ended here, ran out that way. And then if you look behind us here to the south, <clears throat> land drops off and there's a pretty good drop off half a mile away. And then there's a ridge out there, rises back up the ground. You might be able to pick out a monument right to the left of the tour road. Actually, there's a car out there traveling up the tour road. That is essentially the far northern end of the Union 9th Corps. So there's this gap between the 2nd and the 9th, and the 5th Corps is, is helping to fill that gap. And if they were to move forward and something terrible happened, the Confederates break through, you've separated the federal line. So this is a good point to kind of point that out, the good location to point that out, kind of the opening in what part of the Union 5th Corps is doing. The U.S. regulars are making their way across the middle bridge and up towards the center of the Confederate line, so they are assaulting. And when you add all up, there are more casualties in the middle part of the field in and around the middle bridge than down by the famous Burnside Bridge. So there is action here. And just as Union soldiers broke through the sunken road at about 12 o'clock, Federal forces are crossing the middle bridge, pushing towards the center of the line, and also, right about 12 o'clock, U.S. forces have carried the Burnside Bridge. So there's a lot going on right about noon. Now, in addition to John Tompkins' battery, out in the far right, aiding the Federal advance towards the sunken road, and we can look back and about halfway up the hill to the visitor center, depending where you're standing, you might be able to see the two cannons there representing Tompkins' position, assisting 
the Federal Infantry on the left was the battery behind me, Graham's battery. And if the trees in front of us were not here, we would be able to easily see the Pry House, which was where George McClellan was watching the battle. And so you had McClellan, you had staff officers, you had newspaper reporters out on the front lawn of the Pry House. They're able to watch things that are unfolding here, and they were able to see Graham's battery. <clears throat> Graham, in the end, lost four killed, five wounded, 17 horses were killed, and six horses were wounded. Colonel Struthers, part of McClellan's general staff, said, about this time, one of the handsomest exhibitions of gallantry which occurred during the day unfolded in front of us. Graham's battery maintained its position for a half an hour under the fire of 40 guns of the enemy. As they moved in with the greatest deliberation, I saw a number of shells and overthrown men and horses, and during the combat, the battery sometimes appeared covered with the dust and smoke of bursting shells. The affair was observed from headquarters with the greatest interest and elicited the warmest commendation from the general. And so the counter battery fire that they are involved in Confederate artillery positions where we just moved off from, back towards the Piper Farm, as well as the yellow ridge on the other side of the Hagerstown Turnpike, on the other side of 65, you can see that ridge up there. The guns up there, some of them had fallen back from the high ground where the visitor center stands, where they were positioned early on, they fell back to that ridge. They were able to hit this area here. Graham could not hit those guns, and so they're <clears throat> under the artillery fire from in that direction. Question. Were they getting any coverage from the Confederate artillery near the cemetery? Are the Federals getting fire from that direction as well? Yes. Yep. That being said, those guns out there, they're able to see the Federals advancing, but they can't reach the middle bridge, so they're, they're certainly pointing a couple of their guns in this direction. I would say, where's my, yep. I mentioned the burials took place all over the battlefield. All that were buried were not found and reinterred elsewhere. In 1988, four remains were found right out here by the rock outcropping where those two guns are. 1988. At that time, all this area was privately held. So there were some folks out there metal detecting along the rock outcropping and came upon four graves. They alerted the Park Service, even though the Park Service didn't on the land. They alerted the Park Service. Our archaeologists came out. It was determined that the soldiers, four of them, all from New York, more than likely from the Irish Brigade. They advanced right across these fields here. They were able to determine that because of the New York State buttons, crucifixes, rosary beads, and the specific type of ammunition. 69 caliber buck and ball. Large marble with three little pellets behind. At that point, 1988, the state of New York said, rebury those soldiers with their comrades in the National Cemetery. In 2008, another soldier was found, again from New York, north of the cornfield. At that point, the state of New York made the determination that they wanted that soldier to return home. And he was buried in Saratoga National Cemetery in 2009. Those were not the only five that were missed. That's why we say the battlefield is hollow ground. There are certainly still soldiers out here. We're not actively looking for them. That would be like finding a needle in a haystack. But at any rate, that is why battlefields are protected and why they are hell ground. Okay, moving along in our story. We are on the far end of the federal assaults towards the sunken road. Okay. And so the Union 2nd Corps, 1st Division of 5,000 Sedgwick's, they're the ones that go into the West Woods and they had been driven out. The next group of 5,000 French, Three long lines. We talked about their advance. The 1st Delaware, the 14th Connecticut, and others all down over there. Hmm. Right about 10.30, the 3rd group, the 3rd Division from the 2nd Corps arrived on the field. Israel Richardson was their commander. He was later wounded again right out here by these artillery pieces. The cannon here turned upside down is a mortuary cannon. Represents the general locations where Israel Richardson was wounded. If you read the, the marker on there, it says Israel Richardson wounded, you know, 100 yards northeast from this spot. 
There are six of those mortuary cannons on the battlefields in general locations where six generals fell mortally wounded. But Israel Richardson's men start making their appearance on the battlefield. They're moving across the Antietam Creek in the fields out in this direction here. The first line, the first brigade to move forward was the Irish Brigade. We'll talk about them in just a little bit. And moving in on the left of the Irish Brigade, initially on their left, was John Caldwell's Brigade. And we're going to walk out to where they were posted originally. And it's going to kind of add to the story and add to the confusion as to why certain things happen, why, why didn't other troops kind of move in and advance and support and whatnot. <laughs> we're going to cross over this ridge and you're going to might as well not be on the Antietam battlefield. You might even get turned around and not even be able to find the tower or where we even started from. But we're going to get on the far end of the Union 2nd Corps line. We're going to be in the far left. The far right, for those that are familiar, the 1st Minnesota, part of Cedric's men that went into the West Woods. If you leave the visitor center and you drive up Route 65, you'll pass a monument on the right-hand side of the 15th Massachusetts, the Wounded Line Monument. And a couple hundred yards up, there's a right-hand turn that leads you up Stark Avenue. In that general area is where the 1st Minnesota crossed the Hagerstown Turnpike and pressed 500 yards into the West Woods. That's the far other end of the 2nd Corps. How do you command and control a battle line that is stretched out that far? You can't. You can't. I think that leads to the confusion. It certainly leads to more casualties in some cases. We're going to make our way through the field here. Just watch your step going through. We're going to step through the tree line. Again, kind of follow through there. There is a, a fence down. We're going to step over that. Just watch as you step through that, that tree line, okay? We're going to head over this way. You can look out here to your left, maybe through the trees, and see the visitor center where we started from. Right? <laughs> and roughly, roughly how far? That is, oh... About a mile. Okay. It's about a mile because from the visitor center, the tower is a little more than a half a mile, so it's roughly a mile. Okay. About a mile. And it's almost, you could say, from the visitor center out to the far right of the second core, the first Minnesota, is about a mile. We're kind of equidistant to the far end of the, the second core line. Okay. On the other side of the visitor center, if you, if you get that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so that brings up, you know, how do you, how do you control and command and how do you send messages and we know today, I'm, I know that's over there because we have 162 years of knowledge knowing that's where that is. If you're a soldier on a horseback or a messenger, you have no where the hell anything is. You have a property map, and the Confederates were fortunate and that Lee was here in a day and a half before, so he had a better idea of the lay of the land, but you know, it's not a terrain map. It's maybe a map saying the farm is here, this farm is here, and that farm is there. Yeah. So. Did it help? I know the Union used signal core. Right. Did the Confederates use it here at all? Or? The Federals are the ones using the Signal Corps, and they could go from the Northwoods, kind of to the Moomon, the Roulette Farm, out to the Pry House, out to the ridge here, and then out to South Mountain. So they will use it? They could use it. Okay. Yep. I've uh, read about the, no uh, the North using it. I didn't mm -hmm. know the Federals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so stepping through here, this was a, not a tree line at the time, but a fence line, and we're still not quite to the far edge of the federal line. Just on the other side of these trees, the land just continues to drop off. And that would have been position held by the 5th New Hampshire. And so, let's see. Where my finger is here on this map is where the observation tower is located. You can see the red line of Confederates in the sunken road. You can see the Federals uh, assaulting. And we are about right here on the far end of the line. Not quite, I said, if we go on the other side of the trees, we're not gonna walk down there just to save a little bit of time. We're gonna start kind of backtracking the route of Caldwell's men to get to this position. And we're gonna loop around back into the fields and then follow the Irish Brigade in the far left of French's line as they made their way towards, towards the sunken road. But we're starting to move away from the action that's going on. All the action in the sunken road is on the other side of this ridge right here. 
and at some point as Israel Richardson is riding along here trying to get Caldwell, whose men are out here, trying to get them to move and kind of circle on back, Richardson calls out, where is Caldwell? Someone over here yells, oh, I saw him behind the haystack. We don't know where he is. And supposedly Richardson says, damn the field officers and rides off. Well, maybe he wasn't necessarily hiding behind the haystack, but he's just on the other end of the line, on the other side of the ridge, which is what it kind of turned out to be. He was on the far right of the line. And again, it's this rolling nature of the terrain that causes confusion. Those in command can't find those that they're trying to get orders to. Again, guys without maps trying to send troops into certain positions in certain locations. So the terrain really, really influences the decisions that were made, influences the outcome of the battle. We'll point out with the visitor center, I didn't talk about the visitor center when we started. That visitor center constructed in 1962 for the 100th anniversary of the battle. So it's undergoing eight and a half million dollar restoration. It was supposed to be open last September. They're running behind. We hope to be there in August. The inside is completely finished. It's great inside. It's the outside that still needs some work. In addition to all new exhibits in there, we are, we've already filmed a new movie for the park. A lot of the filming and the reenactment um, action was off site, but we did film here in the sunken road. We filmed some down at the Burnside Bridge. It's hard to replicate those, so we did allow some filming there. And the final Union attack was staged out here in the fields behind you because the terrain here, this hill is very similar to the hill on the south end of the field where parts of the 9th Corps were moving up towards the end of the Confederate line. Out here, we, we own this land, which we don't own on the south end of the field. There isn't a tour road running through here and there's not monuments. And so this was a good mirror for the terrain down in that south end of the field. And so a little bit behind the scenes, when you see the new movie, the final attack unfolded right out here in this field. When was that filmed? Uh, October, we filmed it. We're about to get the second draft of it. So, like what we see so far. The film that's shown right now, it's about 25 years old. It just needed to redo and we had to, we were fortunate, the Park Service is fortunate to be able to have all new exhibits, a new movie, and new signs around the battlefield. That rarely happens where you can combine all of those interp um, products together. A lot of your houses seem to be having work done too. It's uh, always, it's always a, an issue. There's always work going on because you have 50 historic houses and they always need work. So the most part, we're, we're restoring the outsides to the way that they appeared and then stabilizing the insides. Stabilizing the insides. If we walk just a couple hundred yards in this direction off this ridge, we would drop right down into the Antietam <coughs> Creek. That's how close we are to the creek from this point. If you've walked the Three Farms Trail, the trail runs right just on the other side of this tree line and connects in with the newcomer house over here and the roulette farm down in this area. All right, we're gonna head out this way. So Brian, this is where Coldwell was to start with before yeah, he moved, moved over. Like from here, running this way. And then he moves. And then he reverses and goes back there. Yeah, okay. Good questions? Okay. So they would have just gone straight across? Yep. We are right here, probably in the far left of the any federal regiment that attacked the sunken road because the Irish Brigade didn't stretch all the way up to the tower either. Is there any witness trees so, around? Oh, down along the, <coughs> the Mumon Roulette, there's a couple down there. Yep, yep. So they had no idea what was waiting for them. No, they other than shoot. French's guys have already been up there. So when they moved through, so the Roulette house right here in front of us, the house, the barn, and to the right of these two buildings, a smaller house at Spring House, was a field hospital. There was a doctor set up in the spring house. Also some Confederates that were out there before the federal assaults unfolded. They were captured and they were being kept as prisoners inside the spring house. Um, there was a big red flag being flown from the roulette barn. So the guys that were moving forward, this third division of 5,000 Richardson's men, they didn't know exactly what was going on, but they had a pretty good idea because of the guys coming off the ridge. They could hear it, they could see it. Uh, the Moomaw barn would have been on fire as well as the house. And if you're green man, you have a pretty good idea in your mind. Yep, yep. Behind here, you would have had a clear view out to the Pry house. So as Richardson's men cross the creek, they're moving through this low area here to the north of us. The Irish Brigade, so you have 
Thomas Marr was a commander of the Irish Brigade, about 1,300 soldiers, three regiments from New York, all Irish immigrants in the 29th Massachusetts, in the Boston area, Massachusetts area. They dropped their packs behind the little stream down there. It's only a stream now when we get some heavy rain, but it's a dry stream bed. They drop their packs there. They move up this old tree right here to our north of us. That tree sits along a fence line. If you're able to go and find the photograph, the Alexander Gardner photograph of the roulette farm, everyone's attention is drawn to the beehives, the broken down, busted up beehives that the Federals from Pennsylvania say were worse than the Confederates in the road when the bees attacked the regiments as they were pouring through the roulette farm. But at any rate, if you look in that photograph, don't focus on the beehives, but in the top kind of left corner, you could see there's a fence and it's this fence right here. And it's right at that point where after dropping their packs, the men made their way to that fence line and that's where they were formed up. Um, Where's the pry house from here? Okay. Straight out that way. Mm -hmm. Chaplain of the Irish Brigade, Father Corby. He said, I gave rein to my horse and let him go at full gallop until I reached the front of the brigade and passing along the line, told the men to make an act of contrition as they were coming towards me at the double quick. I had time only to wheel my horse for an instant toward them and rode away, gave the men a final hasty absolution and rode with General Marr into the battle. Now Marr's plan was his men are carrying smoothbore weapons, again, 69 caliber buck and ball, huge marble, three little pelts behind it. He's using those weapons because his idea is to throw a wall of lead at his opponent. He's going to fire three rounds and then bayonet charge the Confederate position in the sunken road. That's what he's hoping is going to happen. And so right now we're on the far left of the Irish Brigade line. The 88th New York right here advanced towards the tree and up over the ridge. Out in this area would have been the, the 63rd New York. The highest point out here lines up with where the 29th Massachusetts was positioned. And then there's a lane that leads from the roulette farm up right along the tree line out here behind me to the sunken road. And right along the right edge of that line was the far right of the 69th New York. So from here, roughly from here to just a little short of the barn was the front of a brigade numbering about 1,300 men. And as they press forward, Caldwell is over there through those fields we just traversed and will be called back to replace and reinforce the Irish Brigade. So, by this point, the three brigades from William French's division had already been pressed forward. When they got to the top of the ridge, they were fired into, those still standing returned fire, and then the Federal soldiers made that charge down the hill and were quickly driven back. And so that happened three times, the Irish Brigade is the fourth advance towards the sunken road. And it's the fifth that will break through the Confederate line. So we're now going to make our way up, kind of diagonally across, and finish up there at the sunken road. So just watch your footing as you're going through here. It's not too bad walking, but some of these corn stalks are a little tough if you step on them. Just watch your step. What time of day was this? This is right about 1030. That's a great oh. question. I haven't put too much on time here but the fighting the first assaults at the sunken road right about 9 30 and that first group of 5,000 they're involved for about an hour and then at 10 30 the Irish Brigade advances and at that point 10 30 from just out here in front of us all the way to the Moomaw Lane both sides blazing back and forth at one another 10 30 and about that time their federal soldiers are making their second attempt maybe to take the Burnside Bridge and things up on the northern end of the battlefield are, are quieting down, quieting down. Okay. On the lane and out to the other side of the ridge and made a big loop to get to this point. We're roughly in the position that would have been held by, well, early on, the 4th New York moved through here, the 4th New York in the first wave, and the 107th New York was part of the second wave. Out here you had the 7th Virginia or West Virginia, part of the third wave. And then as the Irish Brigade came up, this is about the point of the 29th Massachusetts. Over here, just to the east of us, position held by the 63rd New York. 
Captain Edward Field remembered that the rebels seemed to have a special spite against the green flag and five color bears were shot down successfully in a short time. As the last man fell, even the Irishman hesitated a moment to assume a task synonymous with death. Big John Gleason, the captain of the 63rd, six feet seven inches tall, sprang forward and snatched it up. In a few minutes, a bullet struck the staff, shattering it to pieces. Gleason then tore the flag from the broken staff, wrapped it around his body, putting his sword belt over it, and went through the rest of the fight untouched. Right down here where the trees begin, that is where the roulette farm lane runs back to the roulette farm. That's also the point where the 69th New York joined right to the 8th Ohio. They were part of the third advance of the sunken road. Thomas Galway, he remembered, he was from the 8th Ohio, that Richardson's division came up on our left and the Irish Brigade of that division came into close touch with us. The orderly sergeant of the right company of the 69th New York was kneeling down, I remember, just at my left shoulder, firing away at the enemy. He was a red-headed, red-bearded man, and the whole circumstances oppressed upon my mind from the fact that he put his hand into the haversack of a dead Confederate soldier whose body lay on the grass in front of us and took therefrom a bag of coffee, which he kept for himself, handing to me a bag of sugar. <laughs> Said I went on to recollect that my haversack had been shot away, so I ended up giving the sugar to someone else. <laughs> now, out in front of the Federal advance, the Confederates in the road. There's a monument just on the other side of the fence here, shorter monument before the car's up there. And that marks about the end of the initial Confederate line in the sunken road. The 30th North Carolina was there. Fourth was just out here. The 14th right over this ridge running down towards the roulette lane. And then right at the roulette lane where it runs into the sunken road, there's a couple people standing there and passing it to the next monument on the left. That would have been the position held by the second North Carolina. At the bend in the road was the sixth Alabama. John Brown Gorn said there Bayonets flashed like silver in the sunlight and with the precision of step in the perfect alignment of a holiday parade, spoke of him earlier. That is where they were holding that bend in the line. And then the 5th, the 3rd, the 12th and 26th Alabama ran all the way out to the Muma farm lane. So 2,200 men. At about 10.30 in the morning with the advance of the Irish Brigade from the end of the Confederate line out to the Muma lane, Union and Confederate forces 30 paces away. Thomas Marr said I led the Irish Brigade to within 30 paces of the sunken road, which is right about here. Union and Confederate forces right here, blazing away 30 paces. Right here, the 29th used this hillside, or this little mound right here, as a cover. They had advanced weapons. They had smoothbore weapons, able to fire 300 yards, and they were able to use the terrain to their advantage. And their casualties were much lower than the three Irish regiments. But they were back here, they were able to fire down in that area. I think we're stuck. We're gonna get some rain. So, yep. So. Yeah, I was looking at a color. Yeah, yeah. Soldiers, soldiers in the Irish Brigade, they later remember their lines melted like wax before the fire. commander of this group of four regiments from North Carolina, George Bergwin Anderson, he was, right after the fighting unfolded, he was watching things from the high ground where we stopped earlier, and he was wounded in the foot, in the ankle. Painful, thought to be slightly, it was bleeding enough that he had to be taken from the field, and he was taken back to the Piper farm. He gave messages to his staff officers, come forward to the line, Find Charles Courtney II. Charles II was a commander of the 2nd North Carolina down there. Out there, though, as the messengers made their way, remember there's a cornfield. They got lost in the corn, and they end up all the way on this end of the line where the 30th North Carolina is. Francis Parker is the commander. Staff officers approach Parker and say, Anderson's wounded. We need to find Charles II. Parker says, I know where two is. I'll send a messenger there. The messenger is Fred Phillips. Fred Phillips ran the gauntlet of fire, if you will, all the way down to the bottom of the hill, he found Charles II, gave him the message. 
Anderson has been wounded. You're now in command of these soldiers from North Carolina. So down at the low point in the road, two accepted the responsibility, thanked the messenger for the opportunity, looked out here across the fields to get his own kind of situation report before moving back to the high ground. No sooner did he take command than a bullet slammed in the right temple, exited the left. Dislodged his eyeballs, they said. He was mortally wounded. The messenger, Fred Phillips, he witnessed that. He now has to turn around and go back up there because now Parker is the guy in command of these soldiers from North Carolina. We're standing on the ridge, and if you're over there, you can't see past this ridge. So Parker over there has no idea what is going on over there. He eventually spotted his messenger get to this high point right here, and then he saw his messenger, Fred Phillips, get shot down. So now Parker has to run from there down to the end of the line to figure out what's going on. He took 10 steps around his line of what happened to him. Parker is shot down. The command structure from the road is starting to falter. No message is being sent back to the reinforcements who are moving through the Piper Farm fields to reinforce the Confederate position. One of those regiments, the 16th Mississippi. William Kidd from the 16th Mississippi, he received a gunshot wound through the face and he lied upon the field two days before he was picked up. The ball, supposed to be a grape shot, entered the right cheekbone and came out immediately opposite, fracturing that bone, carrying away the upper portion of the muscle of his face on both cheeks, his entire nose, the right eye, and the entire bony casing of his eye. The upper jaw fell down over the lower jaw and his chin, leaving his palate and his throat exposed, they said. The medical skill of our surgeons, which was provided this young man, have enabled him to walk the streets of Sharpsburg today. Survive that one. Before being pushed into battle, that same regiment, they were lined up along the Piper farm lane that leads from the farm out to the Hagerstown Turnpike. James Kilpatrick said, the enemy's batteries gave us shot and shell in abundance, causing muscular contractions in the spinal column of our line. But all the dodging did not save us because every now and again, a shell better aimed than the rest would crash through the lines, creating corpses and mutilated trunks. So the reinforcements are getting hit, possibly by Graham's artillery, maybe by Tompkins artillery, more than likely from the long range Union guns on the other side of the Antietam Creek that are able to fire and hit that area. Over the past 20 years, we've had about five um, different projects down around the Piper Farm. And we had our archeologists come out and we, before we disturb the ground, our archeologists come out and make sure that we're not gonna disturb something important. Possibly a soldier as we've spoken before. <clears throat> this here is a plot of the Piper Orchard inside the square, that's the orchard. And all the circles are artillery shell fragments that were found in the archaeology that we did. There's a mix of six pound shells, 12 of them, parts of 10 pound shells, 171 parts. There were 12 pound shells and parts of 16 parts from 20 pound long range artillery shells. And that is just in the Piper Farm orchard, not across the entire farm, just the orchard where these apple trees are today going back to the barn. So I'll pass that, you can take a look at that, I'll pass that around. The orchard, our archeologists like to come out to the Piper Farm because the farm was one of the earliest farms that the National Park Service owned here at Antietam. It was owned so long ago that commercial metal detectors were not available. And so a lot of the battlefield, 60% of the, the battlefield today has been acquired in the past 20 years. And so a lot of the field has been gone over by metal detectors. The Piper Farm unusual in that it was not. And so there's always a good chance of finding bullets, artillery shells. And it wasn't just, I have maps like that showing uh, rounds from 69 caliber soldiers from the Irish Brigade firing in that direction in the front of the hillsides. Drop bullets from possibly soldiers fumbling around as they're loading their weapon and nervous, or soldiers that were, were shot down and wounded, killed in the act of, of loading their weapons. So a lot of stuff in and around the Piper Farm. Confederate reinforcements coming up to the road. A lot of confusion because the high command here in the road 
shot down, killed or wounded. So there were no messages being sent back to these reinforcements that are under artillery fire, saying this is where the line is getting weak. This is where we need help. And meanwhile, with those artillery rounds falling in amongst the officers, Ambrose Wright leading a group of soldiers, Georgia and Alabama up through this area here, General Wright's horse is hit in the chest by an artillery shell. That shell exploded, killing the horse and throwing General Wright 12 feet into the air. He survived that, but within about five minutes, he was wounded in the lung and in the leg. And so there were no messages being sent forward saying, where do you need help? And again, the fighting becomes so confusing. Soldiers from Mississippi, as they pour through the orchard and the cornfield, they fire right into the first men they see, their own troops from North Carolina down here. Now it's right about this point where two New York regiments will punch through the Confederate line right here. The 61st and the 64th New York punch through here and instead of continuing to move south, they will turn and start firing down the length of the Confederate line into the flank. Both soldiers from North Carolina and soldiers from Alabama debated years after the war which group of soldiers broke from the road first which were the first to turn and run from the road. I don't know that we'll ever have that answer. But as the North Carolinians start falling back, the New Yorkers up here are able to fire at Confederate troops on the downside of this ridge, and they're hitting and firing the flank in the back of John Gordon's men from the 6th Alabama. John Gordon wounded five times. After he, took, after he was wounded five times, he was taken back to the Piper Farm. James Lightfoot is given command of all of those regiments from Alabama, or I should say of the 6th Alabama, James Lightfoot is taking over for Gordon in charge of the 6th Alabama. He ran back to Robert Rhodes, the commander of all those soldiers from Alabama, and he wanted to pull his line back to fire at the New Yorkers up here. He's given permission to do so. He runs up to his men and gave the order, 6th Alabama about face forward march, which means turn around and march out of the road. He didn't want to do that. He just wanted to pull the line back to contest the New Yorkers up here. But nonetheless, his men turn around and they march out of the road. The next regiment down, the 5th Alabama, the commander Cullen Battle. Cullen Battle was the commander. In the order, I should say, he asked Lightfoot, was that order meant for the entire brigade, the entire line of regiments out to the pike? And Lightfoot said, yes, it was. So from the bend in the road out towards the Hagerstown Pern Pike, the Confederates turn around and march out of the road. So the road kind of breaks in sections. Federal troops will make their way out towards the orchard, through the corn, not towards the orchard, but it's around that same time. Israel Richardson, Union General in charge of this third division of 5,000, is mortally wounded, hit in the shoulder by a fragment from an artillery shell. And after he's wounded, the command structure is faltered, artillery support is not brought up, really no more infantry to throw into the fight at this immediate point. And so at that point, the fighting in this middle part of the field quiets down. We're going to make our way through. Question? We're at about 12, the road breaks, but then there's some follow up to that, which we're going to cover in the next stop, which will be our last stop. We're going to start making our way back to the visitor center, make one more stop in the initial field we walk through, and, and finish up there. All right, we'll head this way. Not in conjuncture, combined with what's going on down here, just on their own, those two regiments move towards behind me sweep up towards the visitor center in the church and they hit the flank of Green's line behind the church. And on the far north end of Green's line another Confederate counterattack hits and so Green's flanks are hit at the same time. Green falls out that direction but those two Confederate regiments up here they move right over the hill where the visitor center stands today. They sweep down across the Moomaw farm lane into the cornfield that's there and while that's going on <clears throat> The federal command that's left over here will pull some of these Union soldiers back and will have them line up along the roulette lane to confront this Confederate attack. So the 8th Ohio, the 14th Indiana, parts of the 132nd, 130th Pennsylvania are along the roulette lane firing in this direction towards the Confederates pressing through. The Confederates got about halfway through the corn. They just turn around and head back in that direction. And so at that point, roughly the the federal soldiers that had pushed through, again, it was kind of a bits and pieces. It wasn't one large push all at once through and out of the sunken road, but it's just a little bits here and there with this attack going on, the Confederate attack. Those guys are all called back. They're running low on ammunition. 
As I said, no messages bringing reinforcements. There really wasn't any infantry at that point to really bolster this part of the line. Those troops are being sent to the north end of the field to fill in where the 1st and 12th Corps were. So right about 1 o'clock, things are quieting down in this middle part of the field. Neither side held the sunken road. The Federals are just on the other ridge north of the road. Confederates on the other side south of the road. 5,500 more soldiers have been killed or wounded in this country lane. Maybe a few hundred yards on either side. In a letter home, a soldier from Alabama, he remembered the adjoining fields were a carpet of red, blue, and gray. The 14th Connecticut, they advanced through the Roulette Farm. And in 1894, here are the veterans. They brought their flag back to the monument. The monument right there was dedicated 1894. That Connecticut monument and the Maryland monument were the first monuments dedicated on the northern end of the battlefield, north of Route 34. Up until that point, 34, excuse me, 1894, all the monuments that were placed, a couple in the National Cemetery and a couple of uh, Connecticut monuments, the 16th, the 11th, the 8th, down in the south end of the field, as well as a couple from Massachusetts on the, the corners of the Burnside Bridge. So these were the first two placed on the northern end of the battlefield. And William Roulette's claim to the government, he said he had 700 bodies buried in his fields. So back to the impact on the community. This is a section of Antietam burial map found about three years ago, New York Public Library. This, this road coming down is the Muma Lane coming into the sunken road. This line is sunken road. The tower sits right here at the corner. On this map, the single slashes are Confederates. The pluses are Union. You can also see on here the roulette farm and kind of help get yourself in a position there is where we are today. 1 of the soldiers killed from the 14th Connecticut. Again, he was in the Army since August. Robert Hubbard, right here. The soldier said on his way into the battle, he was shot by careless handling of a rifle by a member of his own company. More likely he's buried, he's marked by one of those graves on that map. He was buried on the roulette farm. William Roulette right here. No civilian casualties on the day of the battle. His two-year-old daughter passes away just about a month and a half after the battle. Carrie May dies from disease, more likely disease brought in by all these soldiers that moved into his area. That was in October of 1862. Hubbard's family received word that their son was buried on the roulette field. And by chance, the Hubbards had sent a message to roulette. And roulette knew where their son was buried, where their family member was buried. And on New Year's Eve, just a few months after his own daughter died, he's helping a family who had lost a loved one here on the battlefield. And he wrote them, I have received your draft of $70 and have forwarded the remains of your brother by express as you, as you have appraised by the dispatch. I did not buy the coffin from the undertaker as I wrote to you. I bought it from the cabinet maker at first cost, which was $15, consequently saving you $10 for precisely the same kind of coffin. The freight by the express was $30. The dispatch was $1.15, $8.85 for disinterring and delivering to the depot at Hagerstown, the distance of 13 miles, making all the expense $55. I enclosed you the $15 making an all 70. So in the end, if we've walked around and, and touched on a lot of different things, I always mention to people that not only the, 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 the soldiers that fought here, the families who lived on the farm fields and their families back home. Those are in the end, the real stories to take and remember and share when you go back home. And in the end, it's their stories of sacrifice and suffering that took place here that we should never forget when we leave this Antietam battlefield. 
I want to thank you all for joining me out here this afternoon. We'll make our way back up through the little hole in the fence line that we moved down into this field from. Our last hike of the spring season will be next week. We're going to meet down at the Burnside Bridge. And it's going to focus on the fighting in and around the bridge. So we want to thank everyone that's joined us for all the hikes this springtime. Thank you for joining us. And we'll make our way back to the visitor center. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.